Welcome to today's expert lecture on the Russian Civil War between the years of 1918 and 1920. My name is Natasha Baker and I'm the marketing manager for Golden Eagle Luxury Trains and I'm delighted to welcome back a familiar face to present to you today, Major Gordon Corrigan. Uh, Major Corrigan has travelled with us on a number of different journeys as a guest lecturer through Russia and through Central Asia and we're very pleased to be welcoming back on a number of journeys next year as well, starting with our special Winter Wonderland tour by steam in February. So if you are interested in any of those departures, then please do get in touch for further information on those. Now, if you're familiar with Major Corrigan's work, he served as an officer in the British Army for most of his adult life. And now he works as a professional military historian and is also the author of several different books ranging from the Hundred Years War through to the Second World War. And details of all of the books that he's written is available on his website if you'd like to look at those in more detail, which is, Gordon, which is gordoncorrigan.com if you'd like to check that out. So that's it from me. I hope you enjoy the lecture today and I will now hand over to Major Corrigan. Well, thank you, <laughs> Natasha. Thank you very much indeed. And, and good evening, every, or good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Um, I see that my first talk was on the 14th of May 2020, so we've been at it for quite a long time. But I am an eternal optimist, and I'm quite sure we're going to be back to normal and on the wonderful Golden Eagle uh, before, before too long. I'm going to talk this evening about the, the Russian Civil War, which was probably the most appalling, destructive civil war in modern history. Um, it killed probably at a conservative estimate half a million Russians in the fighting to say nothing of the people who died from malnutrition, from disease and from the atrocities which were committed by, by both sides. Um, technically, your history book will tell you that it starts in 1918 and, and finishes in 1920. Uh, but really, it starts with the October Revolution in 1917, and the last foreign troops don't leave until 1922. So, in effect, it's 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 rather longer than <clears throat> than uh, received opinion would have us believe. Um, it was the First World War that really led to the Russian Civil War. Um, al although I don't think that was inevitable. It wasn't inevitable that was going to happen. I mean, it did. Uh, and Russia entered the First World War uh, because she'd been allied to France since 1894. She was concerned about German involvement in the Balkans. She was concerned about Austrian encouragement of Ukrainian nationalism and by the fact that Austria had annexed Bosnia in 1908. She also regarded herself as the protector of the Serbs, protector of the Slavs. So when Austria, encouraged by Germany, attacked Serbia, then Russia felt that she had to come into the war. And the Tsar, Nicholas II, he said, we must protect Russia's position amongst the great powers. So that was as much as anything else, the reason for coming in. Now the uh, Russia-Japanese war that uh, we discussed in my last talk uh, was a wake up call in many ways uh, for, for not just for the army, but for Russia as well. And there had been some reform. Um, Conscription for the army was no longer for life, uh, but all males, or eligible males from the age of 18, they had to do three years with the field army, seven years with the first reserve, eight years with the second reserve, and then five years in a sort of equivalent of the home guard. And then after the age of 41, uh, there was no requirement. But there were huge exemptions, only sons exempt, sole breadwinners exempt, Muslims exempt. So really only half uh, the male manpower of Russia was available uh, for conscription. And there was tremendous discussion backwards and forwards as to how do you motivate a mass army of conscripts who haven't volunteered to be there and reservists. They were still short of heavy artillery. Their communications equipment was out of date. There was a shortage of professional NCOs, the, the corporals and the sergeants, sort of cement of, of any army. There was a lot of political infighting amongst the officers, between those, usually the younger officers who wanted reform, wanted to turn the Russian army into a modern professional force, and some of the older ones who really didn't want any change at all. 
And the too many of the senior officers were still from the aristocracy. Nothing wrong with aristocratic officers if they can do the job, but a lot of them uh, simply couldn't. Um, that said, they had some very good aircraft, which they'd, they'd made in Russia. They had plenty of ammunition. Um, there had been a real upturn in the Russian economy from 1911. Um, so they were well prepared uh, for a short war, but not for a long war. The commander in chief, uh, chap up the top there, was the Grand Duke Nicholas. He was a first cousin once removed of the Tsar, and he was very much a reformer. He was well liked by the soldiers. He was popular. He supported the Duma, this parliament that, that uh, Nicholas had been effectively forced uh, to, to allow from 1905 onwards, although the Tsar spent an awful lot of time trying to circumvent them and prevent the Duma, the parliament, uh, from actually doing anything. And the Grand Duke Nicholas uh, did constantly urge reform. He's constantly saying to the Tsar, look, you've got to reform. You've got to come up to date. The problem is that although he was very popular and very well liked and a reformer, he was a totally hopeless commander. He'd never actually commanded anything. He hadn't even commanded a battalion. He'd never been an active service, despite the great chest full of medals he's got. Um, and, and that was very much going to affect uh, the performance of the Russian army in the war that's, that's going to come. Uh, the Navy, well, of course, as we know from our last discussion, the Far East Fleet and the Baltic fleets had been destroyed in the Russian-Japanese War. The Black Sea Fleet, which had survived, uh, but it was very much out of date. On the other hand, the Turkish fleet was out of date as well. But the Turks were buying modern battleships from the British. Well, at first, things went quite well. Initially, uh, the Russians drove into East Prussia, but then they were fairly quickly pushed out again. And in 1915, when the Germans launched a major attack from this line here, and they drove 300 miles into Russia, up to, to here. And what began on the part of the Russians as a tactical withdrawal, fairly quickly turned into a rout. Uh, and there were shortages, there were shortages of boots. Surprisingly for the Russians, there was a shortage of winter clothing as winter crept in. Um, the government had uh, built a telegraph line all the way from the capital, St. Petersburg, uh, down to the front line. And the soldiers simply chopped down the telegraph poles and used them for firewood. So the communication from government, from the capital to the army, uh, wasn't uh, exactly uh, efficient. As the Germans advanced, the retreat became a rout, became a shambles. There was a forced move of population. The Russian army forced the population in the areas that they were retreating back through. Uh, they made them move. So they're being forced to move. There's looting by the soldiers. There's desertions now, desertions to the Germans. Atrocities to the Jews. Whenever anything goes wrong in Russia, the poor old Jews get the blame. Um, as junior officers are killed in the fighting, uh, they're replaced because the system couldn't produce enough officers to replace them. They're replaced by NCOs, they're replaced by sergeants <clears throat> who are commissioned, and they're the guys who will later on lead the mutinies. Well, in August 1915, the Tsar saw what was happening and he sacked Grand Duke Nicholas and he took command himself. Now, <clears throat> the problem with that is that previously people could say, well, it's not the Tsar, it's the Tsar's advisors, they're useless, or it's the generals, they're useless. But by taking command himself, <clears throat> now the buck stops with the Tsar and he gets the blame. And of course, with the Tsar down at the front, at home, there's a weak government. Uh, the Duma, which the uh, Tsar had been forced to allow, the, the parliament, it's not representative. Um, and the Tsar and his acolytes do everything they can to prevent the Duma having any power at all. Uh, public opinion thinks that the Empress, uh, Alexandra, is pro-German. She wasn't, she was a German traditionally for, for centuries. Russian czars had married Germans. But Alexandra, like all her German predecessors, she had become a Russian Orthodox. She had learnt Russian. She considered herself to be a Russian. And there's absolutely no evidence at all that she was anything but a loyal Russian. But as so often happens, perception has much more influence than the truth. People thought that Rasputin, this mad mystic from Siberia, the monk, they thought that he was dictating Russian foreign and domestic policy. He wasn't, actually. Um, Rasputin had hardly any influence at all on policy, uh, but people thought he had. 
people thought that Rasputin told the Empress what to do and the Empress told the, the Tsar what to do. And again, it's a question of, of uh, perception. Uh, there's a real breakdown in, in rear. People are going hungry. There's loads of food. Russia had a really good harvest in 1914, a cracking good harvest. There's plenty of food, but it couldn't be delivered, couldn't be got to where it was wanted. So the army uh, is not exactly starving, but it's going very, very hungry. The problem was that the railway system was inadequate and corruption amongst the officials who were supposed to be getting the rations uh, to the army and indeed uh, food to the, the population as well. There's increasing opposition to the war. In 1916, the Russians tried to conscript Muslims in the Caucasus, that's in the areas that are now Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, uh, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan and the rest, um, not into the army because they didn't conscript Muslims into the army, but as labor gangs. And the population rose. 20% of the population of the Caucasus fled. They weren't going to be conscripted to be laborers. They fled to China, to Persia and to Afghanistan. The first uh, Russian Revolution, which is um, the February Revolution. Actually, it's March because Russia is still on the old calendar. But as far as they're concerned, it's the February Revolution. Uh, bread riots. There's no bread. Uh, rioters on the streets of St. Petersburg, which has now been renamed Petrograd, the Russian name, because St. Petersburg was felt to be too Germanic. Um, there again, there was loads of bread, but it couldn't be delivered to the shops. And the Cossacks, who were responsible for law and order, were very reluctant to disperse the rioters. Uh, they had a lot of sympathy with the rioters. A lot of the rioters were their relatives or their friends. There were a lot of soldiers in the crowd. You can see on this photograph, which is a relatively peaceful demonstration, lots of soldiers uh, who are some on leave. Uh, some have just left the Petrograd garrison. And in Petrograd, there is a Soviet, uh, which is Russian for council. A soldier's council is formed. And these soldiers are ordered to go back to their units, stop rioting in the streets, get back to your battalions. And those of you who are on leave, get back to the front. And uh, the soldiers council, the Soviets said, no, we'll only go back if we are given immunity for anything that we've done that you think is naughty. We want a reduction in the powers of officers. We want democracy in the army. We want soldiers committees to decide what's going to happen, not the officers. And we demand an eight hour day. Uh, there was a meeting of officers in the Astoria Hotel and the rioters, which included uh, a number of soldiers, broke into the Astoria Hotel and, and shot all these officers. So everything's breaking down. Nothing's working. And on the 27th of February 1917, the Council of Ministers, these are the people who are trying to uh, run the country, the cabinet, if you'd like, submit their resignation to the Tsar. Now, the Tsar has ordered the army to move some units to move from the front up to Petrograd to restore order. And they are to do that within 24 hours. And some of those units who are ordered to move up to Petrograd mutiny. The, the units that do move to Petrograd, the few, the advance parties that move to Petrograd, they're fighting between the army and the police. The rioters open the jails. So there are all sorts of dubious people wandering around the streets of Petrograd. The Tsar thinks, what are you going to do? The Tsar's chief of staff, and the Tsar is the commander in chief, his chief staff officer stops the movement. He says no more troops going to move to Petrograd because he doesn't want the front army to be tainted by what is happening in Petrograd. And he advises the Tsar to abdicate. He said the only thing you can do, Tsar, is to abdicate. So the Tsar telephones all the army commanders, Russian army commanders, and he asks for their advice. And they all say, abdicate. So the army is not prepared to support the Tsar. So on the 15th of March, 1917, he abdicates both for himself and for the Tsarevich, his son. Now his son, as you know, had haemophilia um, and the doctors have told his father that actually hasn't got long to live. Um, he abdicates in favor of his younger brother, the Grand Duke Mikhail. Now, a lot of the liberals in Russia and there were liberals. They wanted, they didn't want to get rid of the monarchy. They wanted a constitutional monarchy. And they're constantly advising this. They want the, the British system uh, where the monarch acts on the advice of his ministers. But the hotheads and the mob, uh, they said, no, no, we don't want, we don't want any question of monarchy. 
Uh, the Grand Duke Mikhail sees which way the wind's blowing and he refuses it, he doesn't want it. And that's the end of the monarchy. It's the end of 300 years of the Romanov dynasty. And a provisional government uh, is formed. The Duma is recalled, so the parliament's back in. Um, and they appoint Prince Lvov, that's a chap on the left, as prime minister. Uh, and he has Alexander Kerensky, a chap on the right, initially as the justice minister. Now, basically, this government is the liberal elite. They're not really representative of the Soviets and of the rioters uh, and, and of the extreme socialists, the Bolsheviks and the, and the Mensheviks. Um, and the government intends to stay in the war. And on the 3rd of April, 1917, back comes Lenin. Uh, he's been uh, in exile, uh, initially in London, then he was in Switzerland. The Germans have uh, extracted him from Switzerland. The Germans have sent him back into Russia via Finland, because as far as the Germans are concerned, anything uh, that upsets the Russians, anything that, that reduces the Russian ability to wage war is going to be jolly good from the Germans' point of view. And the Bolsheviks, and Lenin is the leading light in the Bolsheviks, that is the only power, the only political, sorry, party, the only political party that's demanding an end to the war. All the other political parties, um, most of which were illegal, actually had been prescribed, but they still existed. They all wanted to stay in the war, except for the Bolsheviks. Well, Kerensky then becomes prime minister. Uh, Prince Lvov doesn't have the confidence of the Duma. Kerensky is now the prime minister. He's actually the only socialist uh, in, the, in the government. And he wants to stay in the war. He says it would be dishonorable for Russia to leave the war. Uh, the, all the allies, the French, the British, the Russians have agreed that there'll be no separate peace. Um, we, we all make peace together. Uh, and he wants to stay in the war. Now, it's interesting to speculate what would have happened if he had left the war. But he makes it very clear that they wouldn't. And on the 21st of October, the Petrograd garrison refuses orders to move to the front. On the night of the 24th of October, the Bolsheviks seize the telegraph stations, the telephone exchanges, bridges over the rivers, railway stations in Petrograd and in some of the other cities as well. On the 25th of October, old style, that's what the Russians call the October Revolution. It was the 7th of November on, in our calendar. Uh, and that's the, that's the day that, that the Russians called the October Revolution. Uh, the provisional government, Kerensky and his governor, are, are in the Winter Palace in Petrograd. And the cruiser Aurora fires one blank round as a signal, and the Bolsheviks attack the palace, and they arrest the government. They don't get Kerensky. Kerensky has seen what way the wind's blowing. He's legged it, and he ends up actually in, in America and, and survives. Well, once the Bolsheviks have succeeded in um, arresting the government, the next thing they do is they loot the wine cellar. The St. Petersburg Palace, the Winter Palace, had a particularly good uh, wine cellar, apparently. There is fighting in the street. There's a complete breakdown of law and order between the Bolsheviks and their supporters and the, the, either the monarchists or the more um, liberal socialists. Complete uh, chaos. The Aurora, that's a, a modern photograph. Um, the Aurora is still there. So if you go to St. Petersburg, you can have a wander around it. Obviously, they've painted it up and smartened it up, but it is, it is still there. And now the Bolsheviks are in total control in Petrograd, but not necessarily in the rest of the country. Lenin is effectively uh, the ruler of Russia. His uh, war minister is Leon Trotsky. That's the, the chap in the middle. He's the minister, for, he's a commissar for the army and navy, effectively the war minister. Chap down on the right, um, who's a pretty nasty bit of work, Derzinski. He's in charge of the Okhrana. The Okhrana is the, the secret police. And bottom left, that is Joseph Stalin. Uh, I know it doesn't look like him, but that, that is a photograph of Stalin as a young man. Uh, and his post was really secretary to, to Lenin, um, which sounds pretty innocuous. But in fact, over time, he managed to put all his friends and supporters in various powerful positions. So as you know, when Lenin eventually dies, it is Stalin who takes over and Stalin ultimately who becomes the, the dictator of Russia. But at this point, he's just Lenin's secretary. Very quickly, uh, the Bolsheviks, the Bolshevik government, apply to the Germans for talks about leaving the war. Uh, they go on for an awful long 
time. They keep going on. Uh, the Russians are not prepared to accept what the Germans are demanding. So the Germans simply say, OK, the war goes on and they advance another 100 miles. And eventually, <clears throat> in March 1918, the Treaty of um, Brest-Litovsk uh, is signed and the Bolsheviks move the capital from Petrograd, St. Petersburg uh, to Moscow. They signed the treaty on the 3rd of March and the result is, is appalling. For, for Russia. They have no option but to simply agree for everything the Germans want. And what they have to agree is that you, the Ukraine will be independent. Now, this is a contemporary newspaper drawing. Note that the Crimea is not part of the Ukraine. Now, that's a separate subject which I think I may have talked about before, but it, it was not. It was part of Russia, not part of the Ukraine. They've got to accept Ukrainian independence. They've got to accept German annexation of the Russian bit of Poland and a bit of the Baltics as well. They have to accept the uh, independence of Finland and of the Baltic states. The result of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk is that the Russians lose 34% of the population, 32% of their agricultural land, 54% of their industrial factories, and 89% of their coal mines. Now, of course, when the war eventually ends, the war in the West ends, Russia's out of the war, the war in the West goes on, uh, the Treaty of Versailles actually negates the, the uh, Treaty of, of Brest-Litovsk, and uh, you, the Ukraine doesn't become independent. Um, but Finland and the Baltic states do retain their independence. That's another subject, the, the, the fighting that goes on up there. Um, and the Baltic states, of course, retain their independence until 1940, when the Soviet Union uh, annexes them. The Tsar, meanwhile, um, had been in Tsarko Selo, which is just outside Petrograd. Um, that's where Kerensky had, had put them. The Bolsheviks now move the Tsar and his family to Ekaterinburg, uh, and, he, and they say it's for your own safety. This really is when the Civil War starts. Um, it, well, it started with the, the October Revolution, really. And what it's about? Well, it's the Bolsheviks, the communists, versus a complete mix. There are monarchists, there are people who want to reinstate the Tsar. There are people who want a monarchy, but on the constitutional monarchy role like the British. There are Democrats, there are socialists, uh, there are nationalists, there are breakaway nationalists, there are mercenaries, there are power brokers, there are all sorts of chances and, and dubious people. Um, they never really manage to get their act together. Uh, they're all following their own agenda. And of course, eventually there are the allied troops. Um, and as I said, uh, it killed an awful lot of Russians on a conservative estimate, probably half a million just in the just in the fighting. Now, the Allies wanted to keep the Russians in the war for obvious reasons. Um, they even rather hoped they might keep the Bolsheviks in the war, despite the fact that discussions with the Germans were going on. And if we go back to 1915, the British in 1915 had built a port in Murmansk so that they could supply Russia with the things that Russia needed to stay in the war. Uh, we tend to think of the Arctic convoys as being something that happened in the Second World War, but in fact, it happens in the First World War as well. And the Russians then built a railway from Murmansk uh, all the way down to St. Petersburg, which is well, Petrograd, um, which is about 800 miles. Uh, it was built with uh, rails provided by the British uh, and the laboring was done by German prisoners of war. Now, when we think of Railway. We think of the Burma Railway, the Burma Siam Railway, which was appalling. It was, it was done by the Japanese during the Second World War. Huge numbers of soldiers, uh, British, British Empire, um, Americans died through ill treatment uh, and malnutrition building that railway. This railway from Murmansk to St. Petersburg was just as bad. Um, huge numbers of German prisoners of wars died through ill treatment, malnutrition, disease, and and all the rest of it. But the idea was that the British could deliver aid through Murmansk, which would then be transported down to St. Petersburg and then to the front. Inevitably, an awful lot of it never got to the front. It got creamed off uh, by uh, corrupt officials uh, on the way. Um, now, when it looks as if the, um, the Russians might leave the war, uh, the British send a naval flotilla to Murmansk, which at this point is to protect Murmansk from the Germans. Uh, they're still worried about the, the Germans attacking it. Um, it uh, consists of a, of a British battleship, a cruiser, and a number of armed trawlers. Well, when it looks as if 
Russia is going to leave the war, and it's pretty clear that they're going to sign the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk in March, the British land a company of Royal Marines, 130 of them, in Murmansk, and that's approved by Trotsky. The British say to Trotsky, look, um, we're worried that the Germans may try to uh, take Murmansk, particularly now that you're going to leave the war. Uh, we're going to put a company of Marines into guard it. Are you happy? And Trotsky, Trotsky was, actually. And um, shortly afterwards, uh, the French, they send uh, uh, two companies, I think, of Frenchmen, some Serbs come in and some Finns. So there's a sort of international force there in Murmansk, quite small international force uh, under British command. And they are going to defend Murmansk. And they reckon they can hold 250 miles of the railway on the way to Petrograd. They're not going to be able to hold it, hold it all. Um, and then in July 1918, there's a white coup in Archangel, which is here. And the whites uh, chase the reds out. And um, we've now got uh, a little white base in Archangel. More British troops are landed there. And uh, a British general is going to command the whole thing. Uh, and a French battalion now lands an archangel as well. The Russians, the white Russians, the anti-Bolshevik party, known as the white Russians, that, that's got, actually got nothing to do with, with Belarus, uh, white Russia. Um, this, of course, is a modern map um, at, this, at this stage. Um, Finland, of course, then was, was part of the Russian Empire, as was Belarus, as were the Baltic states, as was the Ukraine. Um, they're called the white Russians from the, um, the French Revolution when the, the royalist supporters were, were the white, the whites. And, and that's why the anti-Bolshevik people call themselves the, the, the white Russians. Um, so from now on, with the Russians leaving the war, there's going to be Allied intervention. And this is when the Allied intervention force is set up formally. And it is going to intervene in Russia in support of the whites. Um, one of the things they want to do, of course, initially, particularly up here in Murmansk, is to make sure that the great piles of stores, uh, war materials, don't fall into the hands of the Germans or now uh, into the hands of the, the Bolsheviks. Well, the Allied Intervention Force, um, it consists of two British divisions, two Japanese divisions, a Canadian brigade, an American brigade, an Italian brigade, a Chinese brigade, um, a French demi-brigade, which is two battalions, and the Czech Legion. I'll talk about the Czech Legion uh, in a minute. August 18, the British capture Baku. Now, Baku is on the western side of the Caspian. It's in what is now Azerbaijan, but it was then uh, part of the Russian Empire. Uh, and they start to expand from there. It was mainly Indian Army troops that, that landed there. Um, and at the same time, the following month, in September 1918, the British push back the Bolshevik forces. The Bolsheviks are trying to take Murmansk, and they're pushed back about 25 miles, and the Americans start to land troops in Archangel. Um, well then, on the 11th of November 1918, Germany asks for an armistice, and the war is over. So the Allies... There's now no question of trying to re-establish an Eastern Front. We don't need that anymore because the, the war is over. And by January 1919, there are 300,000 anti-Bolshevik forces altogether. And by March 1919, there's half a million. Now, these are white Russians uh, plus the various Allied uh, forces, part of the Allied intervention force. And in the first six months, the British provide a million rifles to the White Russians, 15,000 machine guns, 700 artillery pieces, 800 million rounds of ammunition and clothing and equipment for half a million men. Now, of course, the war is over. So the British have lots of surplus uh, war material that they can give to the White Russians. Certain amount comes from France as well. I mentioned the Czech Legion. Now, this was an extraordinary organization. The countries that are now the Czech Republic and Slovakia, and before that were Czechoslovakia, were part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. But the Czechs had long resented being part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They wanted to break away. And one of their great heroes, um, Thomas 
Masaryk up there on the left, he had been agitating um, for separatism, for, for the Czechs to break away. And he got to Russia. And in 1916, he persuaded the Tsar to form a Czech brigade to fight with the Russians uh, against the Austrians. And that brigade would come from deserters from the Austro-Hungarian army and Czech prisoners of war in Russia. There's a, they're starting to form them. Uh, there's the February Revolution. The provisional government, Kerensky, Lvov and Kerensky's government, uh, agree that they can now form the Czech Legion to fight the Germans. And that is 60,000. Drag them out of soldiers. Um, and the idea is that they will either uh, fight the Austrians on the side of the Russians, or uh, when the Russians leave the war, the October Revolution, Bolsheviks take command, Bolsheviks are going to get out of the war, but they agree that the Czech Legion can go down the Trans-Siberian Railway to Vladivostok, and the Royal Navy will then lift them and deliver them to the Western Front, where they'll fight the Germans. Well, that is what happens. They start moving down the, uh, the railway, and then, of course, um, the war is over. So what are they going to do? Well, they decide that they'll stay. They seize the railway, the Trans-Siberian Railway, um, and they decide they're going to ally themselves with the, with the white Russians. Uh, the first commander is a chap in the middle there, a man called uh, General Mikhail Dieterix. He was a czarist general, a Russian czarist general. Uh, he was a monarchist, he was anti-Semitic, strongly religious, um, not the sort of chap you'd want to come to have a dinner party, I wouldn't have thought. Uh, and he is uh, followed by a man called General Radola Gajda, who had been an officer of the Austro-Hungarian army. He was captured by the Russians and he changed sides. And come the revolution, he joins the, the Czech Legion. July 1918, uh, the Czech Legion moving along the Trans-Siberian Railway. Uh, they're getting a bit near a Catherine Bull. So the White Russians are now getting themselves organized. Well, who, who are they? Well, the commanders, the leading lights uh, in the White Russian army. Uh, chap top left there is a Lieutenant General Evgeny Ludwig Miller. He's actually a Baltic German. He's 51 in 1918. He was an officer of the Russian Imperial Guard, and he'd been a military attaché to a number of European capitals. In February, um, he, when the first revolution happens, uh, he is arrested by his own Russian soldiers because the soldiers have started to put on red armbands. And he says, get these red armbands off. Uh, so they, they arrest him and they imprison him. But it's, he's pretty lightly guarded. Come the October revolution, he's out, he's away, and he gets up to Archangel. And he's going to command the white forces in northern Russia, as they know. Uh, next to him is General Lavry Georgievich Kornilov. He's 48. He was a Cossack. He was a colonel in the Russo-Japanese War when he was one of the few uh, relatively senior officers who actually performed uh, pretty well. Um, he was the military attaché in China, the Russian embassy in China. In 1915, he's a major general. Uh, he is captured um, by the Austrians. He escapes uh, back to the Russian army in the February Revolution. Uh, he's the chap who's sent off to arrest the Tsarina, the, the Empress. When the provisional government is formed, they make him the commander in chief. Uh, but he falls out of the Kerensky. He gets sacked. And come the October Revolution, he gets himself down to the, the Caucasus to command a thing called the anti-Bolshevik volunteer army. Ultimately, he's captured in Kuban uh, in April. And he's shot. And he's succeeded by the chap uh, in the middle there. Denikin, Lieutenant General Anton Ivanovich Denikin. He's a Pole, in fact. He's 46. Now, he's an interesting chap because he's a son of a Serb. Uh, son of a serf, sorry, not a serf, a serf, effectively a, a slave. Um, he spent 25 years uh, in the army. Uh, he was a conscript, conscripted for life as they were. And after 22 years, he was commissioned. Um, he, he obviously uh, showed considerable military ability. Um, and he retired as a, as a major. His father retired as a major. So there wasn't much social mobility in Tsarist Russia, but there, there was a bit. Um, his son, 
the general, he joins the uh, the um, Russian army, uh, the artillery. He's a colonel. Again, he's in the Russo-Japanese War, before, performs reasonably well. 1914, he's a major general. 1916, he's a lieutenant general. Uh, come the revolution, uh, he's off with Kornilov again and takes over the anti-Bolshevik volunteer army. And on the right, that's Admiral Alexander Kolchak. He's 44. His breeding is minor Russian nobility. His father was a major general. 1916, when he's promoted to vice admiral, he's the youngest officer in the Russian Navy of that rank. And he is in command of the Black Sea Fleet. When the provisional government took over, Kerensky sent him off to England. And the idea was that he was to get British support for the white Russians, uh, British support for the provisional government, sorry. Uh, and he was then to go to America and see if he'd get American support for the provisional government. Uh, in fact, of course, um, events overtook him. There's the revolution. And so the British send him off to Siberia with the idea that he will command uh, the white Russian forces in Siberia. Uh, and he becomes the head of the white Russian government and commander in chief of all the white forces and his headquarters is in Omsk. I say head of the government and commander in chief, that theoretically is what he was. And that is what all the various army commanders said he was. But in fact, he had very little control over what's happening up in Murmansk or what's happening on the Polish border or what's happening down in the, down in the south. And this is one of the problems, one of the reasons why the whites, the whites lose eventually. Um, down below, the Bolsheviks, Leon Trotsky on the left there, he's 39. He's a Ukrainian Jew educated in Odessa. He's a fluent German, English and French speaker, an early political agitator, exiled to Baikal in 1900, escaped to London. Uh, and he's there with Lenin and all sorts of other uh, people who've been given refuge in London. Lenin, in fact, becomes a correspondent for one of the American newspapers. Uh, and they were all members of the Russian Socialist Democratic Labour Party, as they called themselves, which is one of these political parties that had been prorogued, been banned. Um, in fact, that party uh, split. It split into the Mensheviks, which is a fairly broad church party. It was the party that Kerensky belonged to. Uh, and the Bolsheviks, which were smaller, but much more tightly controlled. Um, he got back into Russia in 1917, and he... There was some, what are you going to, should he be a Menshevik or a Bolshevik? He decided to be a Bolshevik and they made him the commissar for foreign affairs to begin with and then the commissar for army and navy, as I say, the, the <clears throat> defense minister. He formed the Red Army. Now, a lot of the Bolsheviks, a lot of the communists, they said, we've had enough of persecution by an army. We don't want a professional army, a regular army. It's, it's bad news. We want a citizen's militia. And Trotsky pointed out that actually if Russia wants to be a major player, or to have any influence at all, you needed a professional regular army, not a militia. And his argument won the day and he formed the, the Red Army. At the beginning of the Civil War, 75% of the officers of the Bolshevik forces uh, were ex-Tsarist officers. By the end of the Civil War, 80% uh, of the officers of the Bolshevik forces uh, were ex-Tsarist NCOs. They were ex-sergeants who'd been commissioned. Well, as I said, um, 1918, July, Czech legion's getting a bit near Ekaterinburg, and in Petrograd, the Supreme Soviet thinks they're going to rescue the Tsar. Uh, actually, they probably didn't know the Tsar was there, and they probably couldn't have cared less. Uh, but the Supreme Soviet in Petrograd ordered that they be shot, and the entire family were taken down into the cellar and shot. The Grand Duke Mikhail, do you remember? He was the, the younger brother of the Tsar. They caught him as well much later in November and shot him as well. The house that they were shot in was demolished uh, actually by Boris Yeltsin when he was governor of that part of Russia in the 80s because they thought it was going to become a, a shrine to unreconstructed monarchists. Modern Russia has built a cathedral over the where the house was, which is devoted, it's called the Church of the, the Holy Blood. It's devoted to the top uh, floor is effectively, a, it's a museum devoted entirely to the Romanovs, but particularly to Nicholas II and his family, whereas the bottom floor 
uh, is, is a church. And when we eventually get back onto the wonderful Golden Eagle, uh, one of the places we stop um, in the Urals is a Kattenburg, and we go and have a look at, uh, at the church that they've, that they've built. Well, down in Vladivostok, um, which has never been controlled by the Bolsheviks, if you remember the Czech Legion grabbed it and they're still there, this is where a lot of the Allied troops of the Allied Intervention Force are coming in. Uh, this is a contemporary photograph. You can see here it says uh, uh, Vladivostok and here it's American descent. Um, Vladivostok, Americans disembarking. Um, and a huge number of Allied troops came in through Vladivostok. Um, in August 18, the, a Japanese division went in there, more British troops came in there, French colonial battalion came in, three United States, three American battalions came in. They all landed in Vladivostok. And there were so many of them that uh, in September, uh, they decided they're going to have a, a great parade. So there they are having their parade through the streets uh, of Vladivostok. So what are they going to do from there? Well, they're going to form something called the Allied Siberian Expedition. It's going to have 70,000 Japanese, two divisions plus, 60,000 of the French, the Czech Legion, 7,500 Americans, 4,000 Canadians, 2,300 Chinese, 1,500 Italians, 1,500 Brits, and 800 Frenchmen. Now that, on the face of it, that looks a pretty powerful organization. Of course, it's also got artillery, it's got the Royal Navy, and it's got the Royal Air Force. But actually, it wasn't as powerful as it looks. For a start, the Japanese had their own agenda. They, they couldn't care less about defeating the Bolsheviks. They couldn't care less about the white Russians. What they're going to do, are going to try and do, is to annex the maritime province of Siberia. They're going to try and annex that chunk uh, of Siberia that's, that's facing them across, across the sea. The Czech Legion, well, of course, the Czech Legion really are concerned with holding the railway. So there are not really many of them available for, for fighting. Um, the Americans have made it clear initially that they are there to guard stores, to repatriate American citizens, and they're not going to get involved in the fighting. That actually changes later on. Um, what they have done, however, is that the United States uh, Railway Service Corps come in to assist um, in driving the engines and operating the trains, because although the Czech Legion are guarding it, uh, a lot of the Russian engineers and train drivers have disappeared. Uh, so, um, and some of the people trying to drive them aren't terribly competent. So that's something that the Americans have, have got involved in. The Canadians, two Canadian battalions have arrived um, and they are going to guard and police Vladivostok. The Royal Northwest Mounted Police, renamed the Royal Canadian Mounted Police uh, in 1920. There's a squadron of them there and they're effectively the military police for the, the whole of the force. Um, the Chinese, Chinese are interested in guarding Chinese businesses, not interested in doing any fighting. Uh, the Italian legion is formed entirely from ex-prisoners of war who had been captured by the Austrians. So they are put basically to manning the railways and, and guarding static, static points. Um, the UK has decided, the British have decided that they are going to support Kolchak, but initially only in training. They're not going to get involved in combat. Later, of course, they do get in combat. They have to, because what becomes a training mission, inevitably, mission creep, you end up fighting. Um, most of the British effort starts actually in the north from Murmansk uh, and also in the south from Baku, and then switches um, down, to the, down to the south. The French, well, they are there again to train, so they're helping in the training, and they're going to guard uh, French businesses. So on the face of it, uh, we've got uh, Kolchak over here. We've got Denikin's army down here. We've got the British down here near the Gaspian. Um, we've got the Romanians who are now going to have a crack. Uh, we've got the Poles, because, of course, Poland in 1792 was divided between Russia, Austria and Prussia, and Poland ceased to exist. And in 1918, with the Versailles uh, Treaty, Poland is reconstituted. So Poland now is a nation and is, of course, anti-Russian. Uh, again, the British are up here in uh, <coughs> Murmansk, an archangel, um, and there is a, an attempt here from the Baltic states to take Petrograd, which never actually succeeds. Um, that, again, is a contemporary uh, newspaper uh, map, if you like. Well, Kolchak's white army, which he forms, uh, there were about 8,000 Russian officers, Tsarist officers, who'd escaped to Siberia when the Russian, when the October Revolution happens. 
uh, and they start conscripting locals, 18 and 19 year old boys or men. They don't conscript veterans because they think they're tainted. Uh, there are, they let a few in, but basically they're not interested in um, other ranks who've been in the Tsarist army because they thought they've, they've been tainted by Bolshevism, which they probably had been. By September 1918, fairly quickly, they've got 38,000 of them. They've got 70 artillery pieces, which have been provided by the British. Um, the British think, actually, India, we have Indian and Gorkhas regiments with British officers. So why wouldn't it work in Russia? And they form a thing called the Anglo-Russian Regiment, which has got British officers and initially British NCOs until enough Russians are trained. Um, and it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is that the British um, system of, of officering is paternal. British officers were, and indeed still are, lead in a sort of paternal fashion. That is not what happened in the Russian army. It was perfectly normal in the Russian army, including the white Russian army, for an officer to go along the line and a man's got a speck of fluff on his tunic and he'd bash him, he actually thump him, um, knock him down, kick him. That would never, never have happened in the British army. So the Anglo-Russian regiment was brought up on sort of British style. And when they were detached and sent off to work with the white Russians, they'd be grabbed um, by white Russian officers and have the living daylights beaten out of them because they'd been taught to salute in the British fashion and not in the Russian fashion. So, and the British <laughs> persevered with this extraordinary organization until June, 1919. And eventually they said, no, Russia is not India. Uh, and, they, and they gave it up as one of those experiments that just, just didn't work. Um, the mission to Kolchak, who were there um, really technically as liaison, but also advising, you know, telling them, basically what to do, uh, led by a man called Major General Sir Alfred Knox, that's him here in the tropical service dress. Um, he was a fluent Russian speaker, he'd been the military attaché in St. Petersburg, Petrograd, so he, he, knew the, he knew the Russians. Overview of Siberia, now most of the fighting, nearly all the fighting uh, over here in the Russian Far East Siberia is along the railway the Trans-Siberian Railway, which we know very well, and which we will get to know, hopefully, in the near future, even better. Uh, Kolchak has his headquarters up here in Omsk. And even with the railway, which is the fastest means of communication at this time uh, in Siberia, it still took about three weeks to get from Vladivostok to Omsk. And the reason for that was that although they'd started to double track the Trans-Siberian, there were still bits of it that weren't double tracked. And that caused confusion, it caused log jams, and it meant that it took quite a long time to get backwards and forwards. Um, it was known as the Usuri River Front because the fighting started down here along the River Usuri. Um, and eventually the white Russians supported uh, by the allies managed to push their way uh, along from the Usuri Front on up along the river. There were problems in that the Japanese shot prisoners of war, and so did the white Russians. Now to the British and the Americans and the French, this was a war crime, which was not, not to be allowed. And the British mission keeps saying to Kolchak, you mustn't do this. Now Kolchak had promised the British all sorts of things before the British sent them off to Siberia. Um, and clearly he had no intention of, of keeping those. Um, there was a case of a Royal Air Force uh, aircraft that was shot down. Uh, the pilot was pushing his luck, he was flying far too low, he got shot down, he landed his plane, his wingman landed as well, intending to pick him up, uh, and a pair of the pilots were, were rounded up and, and shot. You know, atrocity breeds uh, atrocity. Well, Kolchak's offensive, um, don't worry about this, it's a bit of a busy map, but his offensive, he pushes on from the Azuri front all the way up the river, these are various little battles along the way, and he gets right up to Chelyabinsk up here. So he's he's progressing, pretty well. Uh, he pushes on and he takes a place called Ufa. And then really they, they run out of steam. And in March 1919, there's a red counterattack. By this time, Trotsky's got the armies back together or the Bolshevik armies back together. And um, they're pushed from Ufa back to Chelyabinsk. A British armored train almost gets captured by the Reds because it runs out of water. 
Now, obviously, a train, steam train, needs water to turn into steam. And what the crew have to do is get out and shovel huge amounts of snow. <clears throat> Fortunately, this particular period, there was lots of snow still. Uh, and they melt that down to water, and eventually the train gets away, but, but only just. Uh, that actually is the farthest that the, the whites ever got. Uh, from now on, uh, it's backwards uh, pretty well uh, all the way. Both sides used armoured trains. Uh, the British armoured trains were run by the Royal Navy. Now you say, what on earth is a Navy doing running trains? Well, the reason was that the guns on the armoured trains were naval guns. So they were taken off ships and mounted on, uh, on trains. Um, so the whites are withdrawing back. They're fighting, fighting retreat all the way back along the Trans-Siberian Railway. Um, by July 1919, the British, I think, have come to think that maybe they've backed the wrong horse. Things are not doing well, uh, and they start to withdraw as well. Uh, and eventually, most of the British troops are back uh, in, uh, in Vladivostok, still holding Vladivostok. Um, and Kerensky's um, Kolchak. Kolchak has really uh, run out of steam. Uh, the Royal Navy is still there. They are still there in gunboats in the rivers, but most of the troops, the land armies, uh, are, are pulling back. And much the same thing is happening up in the north, up in, in Murmansk. Kolchak uh, is withdrawing in his train and he gets as far as Irkutsk here. It's the summer where we'll see when we go on the trans siberian Railway. His train is surrounded by Bolshevik supporters. He's pulled out, he's shot, and they throw the body through a hole in the rice, uh, in the hole in the ice uh, in the river. And command now devolves uh, on Denikin. This is a photograph I took a few years ago. It's in Irkutsk, which is where Kolchak was killed, and it's a statue of Admiral Kolchak which modern Russia has put up a few years ago. And I said, when I got there to my Russian chum, how do you, how do you rationalize this? I mean, you've got Karl Marx Alley just down the road, you've got Lenin Prospect, and here you've got a statue of Emerald Conte. And he said, well, we are desperately trying to come to terms with our own history. He said, and the Russians do have a sense of humor. He said, our problem is that we are a country with an unpredictable past. Now, most countries have got an unpredictable future. Uh, he said, I've learned one version of Russian history under Stalin. He said, I've learned another under Khrushchev. I learned another under Gorbachev, and I'm learning another uh, under Putin. But they are trying to, to come to terms with, with their history, which is, a, which is a good thing. Instead of just airbrushing it out, they are actually saying, you know, um, this is what happened. And, and this statue is of Admiral Kolchak. Um, well, when you look at this, this is where the whites supported by the Allies have got to. Miller up here in the north, um, got this, this attack on Petrograd over here, got the Poles over here, you've got Denikin's army here, Kolchak's army here. So if you just look at that, you think, well, this is good. You know, they're, they're closing in on Moscow. They're, they're, this, is, this is looking good. <clears throat> but in fact, um, it just doesn't happen. They just don't get any further, uh, further on. Um, by the end of 1919, the Allies are, are pulling out of Murmansk. Uh, the mission is still there. The Royal Navy is still there. The Royal Navy are the last people to leave. The gunboats on the rivers and, of course, ships um, in, in the Black Sea uh, and, and in the Baltic and up in the, in the White Sea, the Barents Sea. Some of these little battles, um, they're happening all over the place. There's one which I think is quite interesting. Uh, we all think of the Battle of Stalingrad as being the seminal battle of the Second World War. That, that really was the tipping point of the Second World War, the Battle of Stalingrad um, in 1942-43. Well, Stalingrad originally was called Tsaritsyn, then became Stalingrad. It's now Volgograd. And, and there's Volgograd. It's on the River Volga. That's the River Volga. Uh, there's the River Don. And at one point, Volgograd was held by the Bolsheviks and the white Russians were determined to get them out. And the attack is led by a British tank. Now, there was only one enough petrol available for one tank. There were more than one tanks there, but there's only petrol for one. And this tank was commanded by a chap called Major Bruce. Now, Bruce 
had won the military cross on the Western Front fighting the Germans. He'd also lost his left arm. This photograph, of course, was taken when he was much younger and he still had both arms. So he's in Russia, part of the Allied Expedition, uh, Intervention Force. He's commanding this tank and he leads this white Russian force into Volgograd, completely writes the Bolsheviks, um, and he takes something like 4,000 uh, Bolsheviks prisoner. So it's a great, great victory uh, for the whites. And there are lots of these little battles that happen uh, all over Russia. It's a sad story about Bruce because Bruce um, went off after Russia. He got the Distinguished Service Order for his performance in Russia. Uh, and he went off and joined the Royal Irish Constabulary Auxiliaries. And you remember there was a rising going on in Ireland at this time. And he was sacked from that because he struck a civilian. And then he went with two contemporaries and he robbed an Irish creamery and he took the contents of their till, which was 75 pounds. Now, 75 pounds was a bit more then uh, in 1920 than it is now. And he was court martialed and sentenced to a year in prison. His military cross was forfeited. His DSO was forfeited. He was then declared a bankrupt in 1924. And in 1925, he died of double pneumonia. So it's a sad end to a young man who was clearly tremendously gallant a lot of leadership and it all it all went it all went wrong sadly uh, he's only one of the very few that went wrong there were a few others but most most didn't casualties as i've said huge amount of casualties, at least half a million russians killed in the fighting plus all the others that died of malnutrition disease and atrocities british death 938 american deaths 424 um, they're the two that have the major uh, deaths. As I said, the Americans started off by saying we're not going to fight, but of course they, they did, they were drawn into it. Those deaths weren't all caused by Bolshevik bullets. There were a number of deaths through typhus, and of course the so-called Spanish flu hit uh, as well. So some held on. The Japanese held on to Vladivostok until 1922, but by the end of 1920, uh, the, the other allies had left. Uh, the Bolsheviks were in control. Why did the whites lose? Well, there was no civilian administration. They'd set up an army or a number of armies, but they didn't do anything about a civil administration. There was no control over the various armies. Each commander did his own thing. There was really very little liaison. Um, local leaders just did their, did their own thing. Um, the economy, there was no money. The British provided the whites with a certain amount of money, but there was no money for the country. When the whites seized land, captured land, they returned it to the original owners, not to the peasants. They promised nothing for the peasants. And the logistic system broke down. There was a wholesale sale of kit and equipment to all sorts of people who shouldn't really have had it. And disagreement among the whites. They could never agree as to what they wanted and what they were going to do. But probably the major factor was the popular Russian population that had enough peace at any price they don't care who gave it to them it was the whites or the bolsheviks or anybody else we want we want peace and that of course is what they got as far as the white russian commanders miller got away to paris he was kidnapped from paris in 1939 by a russian kidnap squad taken back to moscow and shot denikin got away to america he died in 1947 Putin repatriated his body and he's been buried in Moscow. Again, this business of coming to terms with the history. Kornilov, um, he was killed, as we said, in Kuban and buried. The Bolsheviks, when they took Kuban, they disinterred and, and burnt the body. Trotsky, as we know, was eventually expelled from the Communist Party. Uh, there was, although there were a lot of Jews, original Bolsheviks were Jewish, soon yet another pogrom. The Bolsheviks turned against the Jews and a lot of them were shot or exiled. Um, Trotsky was exiled, of course, ends up in Mexico. <clears throat> and in August 1940, he's assassinated by a, a Russian assassin who kills him with, a, with an ice pick. So that is a quick run around uh, the Russian Civil War. Obviously, there's far more to it than that. But unless you've got three weeks to listen to me, uh, I've tried to cover the, the main points. And if there are any questions, I shall be delighted uh, to try and try and answer them. But thank you very much indeed for listening. You made a very complex subject into a very interesting lecture there, as always. So thank you very much for that.
And thank you to everyone that's joined us today. Obviously, we've been really appreciated your support as we've been doing these online lectures uh, over the last 18 months. And we'll be taking a short break from the online lectures um, over the next few weeks. But if you do have any requests or if there are any particular subjects that you would like us to cover on these online um, webinars, then please do get in touch and we always appreciate your suggestions. And um, one question that uh, we had prior to this lecture, um, Major Cardinal, I don't know if you can answer, is do you have any recommendations of museums in uh, Russia, whether it's in Moscow or St. Petersburg, that uh, are, would be good to go to uh, to revisit this subject? One of the things that the Russians are terribly good at, and I think I've probably mentioned this before, they are brilliant at museums. Um, St. Petersburg uh, has a whole stack of museums now rather less emphasis on the October Revolution and the Civil War that there was, because it's something that they're a bit sort of shifty about. But they are wonderful museums. I mean, the, there's the Fabergé Museum. There's, there's a museum of textiles, lots of military museums. I mean, the, the Russian military museums are the best in the world, in, in my opinion. And I've been around the world and seen an awful lot of military museums. Um, so there are loads of loads of things. The Russians are very, very good at they they spend a lot of government money getting their museums, their museums right. Um, there's lots, of course, lots of books written about the Russian Civil War. Many of them are actually a bit tortuous. You know, you really have to stay awake to read them, but there, but there are some. Um Waterstones in in the Russian section has got lots of books on it. Um but, uh, but museums, I mean, railway museums, if people are interested in railways, and obviously you probably wouldn't go on the Trans-Siberian unless you were, uh, there are some excellent railway museums. You know, you can see every sort of engine that's ever been in Russia. Um, so lots, lots of things to see, both in St. Petersburg and Moscow. Um, and indeed, when we're on the Trans-Siberian, of course, we, we will be visiting uh, a number of museums dealing with all sorts of aspects of Russian life and, and, and Russian history. Yeah, that's a really good advice for those that are visiting um, those cities, hopefully in the near future. Uh, we had another couple of questions come through. First, I'm not sure, I'm sure you've read uh, the novel or aware of it, Do of Dr. Shivago, but we've had a question to ask how true to history is that novel? Are you aware of that? Well, of course, it was written by somebody who, who knew what he was writing about. Um, and I think like everything else, the things that happen in it, I think they all happened. They didn't necessarily all happen to the same family or the same person. They didn't all necessarily all happen at the same time. But I think it's um, in the sense that, that Dickens is representative of Victorian London, then I think Dr. Zhivago is, is representative of, of the period in Russia that he's, that he's writing about. Um, but of course, every writer has their own agenda. Um, so, so one has to remember that when you're reading, actually, any Solzhenitsyn, the same, you know, bear in mind there's an agenda there. But, but yeah, I think it's, I think it is reasonably represented. Have you ever visited um, Archangel in Russia? Yes, so I have. Um, I'm just asking what there is to see there. Well, the if you're me, it's fascinating. But of course, I'm I'm sort of interested in, in military things. There is a captured British tank on display in the main square on a great sort of plinth of concrete, uh, which the Bolsheviks captured, the Mark V tank. But what is interesting is that there is a set, there's a British cemetery in Archangel of the, sol the British soldiers who were killed fighting the Bolsheviks as part of the Allied intervention force. And that cemetery has never been trashed. Now, you would expect them to trash it, wouldn't you? I mean, after all, the USSR trashed any German cemeteries from the Second World War, any German soldiers that were buried in, in Russia. The Soviets just plowed up the, the cemetery. And you would have thought that they would have done that to the British cemetery in Archangel, but they haven't. And I've been there. And, and uh, it is, um, they, they've allowed uh, the, Commun the um, Commonwealth War Graves Commission, uh, the work is done by locals to, contract out and the gra grass is mowed and and the flowers are tended um and i find that very odd and, and actually very encouraging i was delighted and i said to the russians you know how, how delighted i was that that our dead uh you know were being respected because i suppose i could have understood if they hadn't been but um 
not an awful lot else to say. Mamansk, um, <laughs> Mamansk, are frightful. Uh, again, Mamansk is interesting. Um, it's the, the 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 base for the the Great Northern Fleet, which at the moment consists of a very old aircraft carrier that belches out black smoke, and a sort of listing cruiser, the Peter the Great, and a lot of very scruffy sailors hanging about and a great row of nuclear reactors decommissioned. There's a great row of them. And uh, there was only a chicken wire fence around them. And the British now are paying them an awful lot of money to have them properly decommissioned because it's quite dangerous. But there's an awful lot of Russian naval officers who've retired and stayed in Murmansk. Why you'd want to stay in Murmansk or Archangel, I, I don't know. Um, I met a, um, a German, uh, a Russian, um, retired naval commander when I was in Murmansk and I was having a drink in a bar and he wanted to practice English which is just as well because my Russian is rudimentary and uh, there is a camaraderie amongst servicemen even if whether they're the enemy or not you know you're both in the same business you're trying to kill him he's trying to kill you that's your job but you've got an awful lot in common and uh, and so we were chatting away and, and he bought me a beer and I bought him a beer and I said to him, there's something I've always been interested in, because in, in, their nuclear submarines are based in Murmansk. Your November class submarines always had two reactors and ours only had one. So how much extra power did you get with the second reactor? He said, no, no, Gordon, you do not understand. The reason we have two reactors is one always breaks down, which was a bit worrying. <laughs> um, sorry, I can't remember what the question was. <laughs> have I answered it? Definitely have answered it. Was, uh, we, we've had other questions come through, so I'll just ask another question. Um, whilst we'll, I'll, we'll have time to obviously respond to these, um, the rest of them by email afterwards, but we've got time for um, two more questions. Uh, the first was, How do you feel that it's the, the story of the Russian Civil War is told in Russia today, for example, in Russian schools and education? They, they do tell it, um, they try to tell it in a balanced way, as far as they can. Um, it does change from time to time. I mean, they start off with Stalin as an absolute rogue and all Stalin's statues were torn down. Now they're beginning to say, well, Stalin did win the Second World War. They're starting to rehabilitate him. They do, but they do teach the, the Civil War. Um, in a reason, as far as I can gather, in a reasonably balanced way. Um, my own thoughts are that they had two opportunities for this not to happen. One was in 1905, when you remember that that's mini, that mini revolution, um, that, that and the, the results of the Russia-Japanese war, I mean, the two were interlinked. Uh, there's a the mini revolution put down with great brutality, 14,000 people were shot as a result of that. Um, but the Tsar was forced to make some concessions. He, he allowed a Duma a parliament. Um, that was the opportunity. If then the Tsar had allowed a representative government, and if he'd moved towards a, mon a constitutional monarchy, then everything might have been okay. And the other opportunity, I think, was Kerensky. If Kerensky had left the war, that may well have taken the wind out of the Bolshevik sails. And Russia might, might, I say, might underlined, have developed into perhaps not a Western democracy, uh, but a more acceptable form of government. Th those are the two opportunities, I think, when all this bloodshed need, need not have happened. Um, but, but the answer to your first question is, they do teach it. I mean, they have to. Um, they try to teach it in a balanced way. A, a lot of it depends on the views of the teachers, and most teachers actually are pretty anti-communist, um, from, from what I can see. That's very informative. And then last question we'll answer live. Um, but like I said, we'll get back to everyone else's questions um, tomorrow by email. But the um, lady here just wanted to ask, what happened to the Czech soldier, soldiers in the end? And did they ever get back home? They did eventually. Um, they, they were moved um, by the, mainly by the Royal Navy, but by the French as well. Uh, and they eventually uh, did get back. And of course, if you remember, one of the results of Versailles <coughs> was the creation of Czechoslovakia. The Austro-Hungarian Empire 
dissolves, collapses completely. Uh, so all those bits that belong to the Austro-Hungarians, uh, you know, bits of Romania, uh, bits of uh, a third of Poland, uh, the Czechs, the Slovaks, uh, Hungary, all the rest of it, uh, become separate countries. And Czechoslovakia. Uh, now, of course, that was always, uh, and most of the Czech Legion got back, the, the ones that survived. Uh, of course, Czechoslovakia was always an artificial state. Uh, and the Czechs and the Slovaks have never, never got on. Um, and as we saw during the Second World War, when they, um, uh, the, 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 in Yugoslavia, uh, the animosity between the various racial groups. So it's not surprising that uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed effectively and uh, Czechoslovakia could uh, do their own thing, that they split into the Czech Republic and, and Slovakia. Um, they're probably, I don't suppose any of the Czech Legion is still alive, but I've no, no doubt their, their children will be old men. I've never met one. I, I have asked when I've been there in Czechoslovakia, but, uh, or in the Czech Republic. I've never actually met any, but, but they do know about it. You know, they say, oh, yeah, Czech Legion, yeah, we know about that. Oh, well, thank you very much for answering all of those questions, uh, Major Corrigan. I'm sure it's much appreciated by those that have joined us. And as I said, we will try and answer um, all of those in more detail um, by email tomorrow. So thank you again to everyone for joining us. And we hope to see you again on one of these lectures and in real life uh, very, very soon. So thank you very much. <laughs>